Okay, hi everyone. This is Ron McKinney with Parada uh, Photo and doing our latest webinar. This one's going to be with uh, Martha Worth, who actually uh, uh, won our first ever photo competition with one of her underwater photos um, uh, earlier this year. That was a really fun shot. Um, and uh, she's going to be talking to us today, you know, about underwater photos. And, and, and the beauty of it is, is about how some of you can start doing it without, you know, really like uh, uh, paying like way too much money to, uh, to even just start trying it to, and, and seeing if it will work for you. That's kind of the beauty of it. So Martha, welcome to, uh, to our webinar. And uh, if you want to like, just kind of like introduce yourself and tell your story a little bit about how you got into uh, underwater photos and, and your journey in, with it. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. It is truly an honor and an exciting thing to be able to share this. Um, I am a former dancer, choreographer, and teacher. So I have been doing dance photography for about five or six years now. Um, and I had seen this underwater behind the scenes photo shoot with, um, I, I actually cannot remember the guy's name because I can't find my video anymore that I had of it. But he had done this really cool underwater shoot with fabric and dancers and lighting and all this stuff. And so that kind of inspired me to want to try it out. And then it took a couple years because I had absolutely no idea how to try it out. I was looking for underwater housing and they were extremely expensive and I didn't have that kind of money. So eventually I was talking to a friend and she told me about a website called Swimply that is like an Airbnb for pools. And she said, you should go try them out and just rent a pool, someone's backyard. So last year I ended up doing that and I rented also a underwater housing from a local photography um, rental company and just tried it out and tried out the pool. And that's kind of how it got started. So I found a way, but the first pool was horrible and very disappointing. And I couldn't achieve this look that I had seen in this guy's photos. And so then I started to realize how can I troubleshoot? How can I adapt? How can I make this work with what I have? And so I started trying different kinds of pools, different looks of pools, and I went with all natural lighting. So I found that that is the easiest for me on how I wanted to achieve kind of that deeper, darker depth look as if they really were in the ocean or just floating in the middle of nowhere. So that's kind of how it got started. Um, I really found that I could find a way to do it without being super expensive and where I could make it, um, I wouldn't say cheaper, but more affordable for my clients and people who were really interested in it. So yeah, so I started out with that first pool. It was a chlorinated pool with a white bottom and it was absolutely horrible. Um, I found that chlorine produces a ton of little micro bubbles. And so that causes the clarity to go down significantly. Um, also, the entire bottom of the pool was filthy and dirty, and that showed in every image, and I'll show you some images in a second. But I went on to try saltwater pools and try to find pools that had a different lining so that it was a darker blue to really fit into what I was looking for in an end result photo. So I rented the uh, equipment from, like I was saying, the local company. Um, and it is this kind of, um, I don't know, it's like a baggie, uh, but it's a very thick rubber and it's from a company called Autex and it just changed my life. They're, they're really affordable. They're about 450. Um, and then you get lenses that come with it that go on the front of your camera and on the back of your camera and all of their lenses are, um, are glass so it's really nice you don't have to worry about the plastic or acrylic lenses so those all work they also have dome lenses that also are there and these bags can fit pretty much any camera which i have two different kinds i use a, a sony a9 and a canon so i could fit anything into this as well as most uh, lenses 
and the lenses, I started talking to people and finding what worked the best. And the closer you can get to your subject, the better. Uh, without trying, you know, without getting that distortion on the ends of their body and all that. So I stay around a 28, but sometimes I have gone down a little bit lower so I can get a little closer if the clarity of the water isn't perfect. So, we, we yeah. Have, uh, okay, very good. Rich, Rich uh, answered it for her and gave her the out text. But I want to jump in and, and uh, just follow up with Lynn's question and, and just let everybody know that uh, if you have any questions, as Martha goes along this, I'll be, I'll be uh, sharing the questions uh, with her without trying to interrupt her as I just did. Um, <laughs> no, you can interrupt, and, please. <laughs> and uh, so, so put them in the chat, not in the Q&A, and be sure, you know, whenever you do that, that you're, that you're putting it for, um, for not just the panelists. It defaults for the panelists, and, um, but we want you to... Uh, uh, put it for panelists and attendees so everybody can see your questions. Okay, Martha. Uh, um, so, so um, Lynn had just asked what was the name of that company, and and, and uh, Rich had answered that was Outtex, O U T E X. Correct. And uh, and I think you're going to be sharing some information about um, that uh, you are a uh, like like an ambassador for some of these companies and and that uh, you actually have a discount code that you can provide people. Correct, so yeah, Autex has given me a discount code that we will share um, with everyone that they can get a 10% discount off of anything that they purchase on their site. And you can find all their information and all the things on autex.com. It's very, um, I, I love it because I, again, it's not super expensive and out of my budget. So really the only things I have paid for is, is my equipment, of the Outex housing and then the pool rental and then everything else I do with natural lighting. Um, I also use a weight belt to hold myself down um, in a pool so that I can be steady when I go under. Uh, I, I don't use any kind of uh, equipment as far as breathing equipment. I just hold my breath because most people can't hold their breath for very long anyway, especially if they're moving a lot underwater. So. Um, that's really the only equipment I use is my camera, my Outex, and a weight belt. So that helps keep my costs down and makes it affordable. And then, of course, the pool. And I know that Swimply has pools all over here in America, but also some of the other pools that people can find pretty much anywhere are um, like at rec centers, exercise centers. You can also look into uh, scuba diving schools. They have pools as well. So just finding pools, if you're gonna use natural light that you know, have a pretty good natural light within, uh, with an, in an indoor one, because I've used some indoor pools that were terrible and then some indoor pools that weren't so bad. So I prefer outside just because I like the sunlight, but, um, but I really, you can find it, pools anywhere. And you'll find that most people are pretty willing to let you come in and you know, use their pool, whether it's a rec center or a scuba center, they are, are pretty open to letting you rent it for an hour or so. So yeah. Can you, can, can you spell out um, what the name of that? Uh, Swimply, uh, yeah, it's, it's like simply, but with a SW. So it's S-W-I-M-P-L-Y. Dot com. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and just, I, I think she said that, but I, I think they have them all over the US, so. They do. That um, I believe it's in most states. I have found that if you just put in, like here in Colorado, if you just put in Colorado, it might not always bring up everyone in Colorado. So then I'll go and I'll put certain cities in Colorado, and then you'll get more options. Um, but yeah, most mostly it's people's backyards that I I've been in really weird, <laughs> weird places. I have to say, um, but finally found one that I love and has a great rapport. I have a great rapport with the owner now. So I just go through him directly and schedule all my dates and work with him. So I, I have found that people are so interested in doing it, um, really love it and have so much fun. And so I do it in group sessions and I have about six people, six to seven people that I have signed up for a two and a half hour period of time. And they come and we rotate through them 
throughout the whole two and a half hours. So one will get in for a few minutes and do their session and get out and change and the next person will get in. So we'll just rotate because it's very difficult for them to really um, be able to go for a long period of time because you're spending a lot of energy uh, holding your breath can get exhausting. A lot of them the first few times have a hard time staying under because of that fight or flight kind of mentality that your body starts going through. So um, I, I've dealt with a lot of interesting things with people for sure. It's been fun. So yeah, so that's it, kind it, of it, where it started. Yeah, before you move on, Martha, um, mm -hmm. when, when you uh, are picking out a pool now, you said you went through this thing of like finding the right thing. So, so right. if it's if it's just a chlorinated pool, you're generally not going to take that one. You're going to go for something with uh, salt water. Is that correct? correct? So for okay. me, what I have found is my ideal um, conditions for what I look for, uh, for the look I'm going for, which is that depth and that deepness look, is a darker lining of a pool, the saltwater pool, um, where a pool has a lot of sun coverage or shade coverage. I have found some pools... Like there's a tree there, so it's blocking, you know, part of the surface of the water. So then you have underwater, you have like part shade, part sun, and that sometimes can really be strange. So if I could pick it every day, it would be cloudy weather, saltwater pool, dark um, lining. And the one that I have uh, used goes from about four feet down to nine feet. So I like that option because then they can work right at the like the ramp level so where it's about at their chin or their shoulder level if they go too deep sometimes it can get too murky and the color changes because the light can't reach down to the nine feet so then you get more of just these blue tones on their skin that you can't really draw out the natural skin tone so i like to stay around the five foot kind of depth level uh, so that they can sink if possible. But those are my ideal conditions, but you kind of have to obviously go with what you get every day. Uh, some days it's been super sunny. Some days the water is not clear and you have to just work with what you have. So yeah, it's kind of fun. <laughs> cool. It's always an adventure for sure. Um, so I'm just going to show a few photos from the very first pool and then just kind of the progression of what it looked like. Okay, and, and how deep can you go with, with the, uh, the Altex uh, uh, housing? I don't know exactly for sure, but I know people use it in the ocean and stuff. So I'm, I'm assuming it can go pretty deep compared to what, um, well, depending I think what your camera can do. Uh, I, of course, have gone down to the nine foot level and it hasn't done anything. So I'm assuming it can go quite deeper. But I don't know the specifics on that, on that, um, on that for sure. Okay. So let's see some pictures. In. Okay. So these first ones, of course, were some that were not always the best in the world. So this was the very first pool that I used, uh, which was the chlorinated white bottomed pool. Okay, now we're, we're looking at like your finder. Can you, can you uh, oh, put it up on preview? Yeah, I apologize. Just a second. Let me go back to that. Thank you. Okay, is that better? Yes, that's it okay. right there. Um, so yeah, so this was uh, the first pool the chlorinated with the white bottom. Uh, it just kind of looked like they were in a pool to me. Um, but I didn't love how all of these micro bubbles just were constant all the time. Uh, so again, you can see first attempts were horrific. <laughs> this you, almost you, made call, me you call it horrific, but I'm sitting there going, <laughs> wow, this is pretty good, man. <laughs> well, I am a I am a stickler for clarity, and so I really hate noise. Um, I'm learning to love it more, but for me, these just didn't come through with what I wanted it to look like. And so I thought, how am I going to make this, you know, turn into what I want it to look like? 
But as you can see, like all these tiny little micro bubbles were almost in every single um, photo. So that was the very first pool. And then I found a saltwater pool, which is this one. Um, this pool was only about four feet deep by four feet wide by like 10 feet long. So it was a super oh. tiny pool, but it gave that depth and that color that I was looking for. Yeah, it's a huge, huge difference. Yeah, you can tell that like the bubbles are more, more defined and you don't have all those tiny little micro ones that are coming around and just killing your shot. Same pool, the four foot by four foot pool with very tall people. And I don't know, I still don't know how we got some of them to actually move, but had to do a lot of editing on the outside because you were able to see like all of the walls and all of the stuff at the bottom of the pool. Again, the four by four foot pool. But this was finally the look I was going for. This was finally the depth and the the feeling of that ethereal feeling of them just being out in the middle of nowhere. And, and these are taken during uh, daylight, is that right? Correct. So um, this one is when it was cloudy. So I love the cloudy because you don't get all the, the um, distortion on the body and the face and the skin from the sunlight coming down from the top of the water, like this one. This is when it was full on sun. And you can kind of see the back of the pool here. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't help it most of the time. Sometimes um, if you, I have found that when they don't disrupt the water too much under the water, then you get less of this, even if it's bright sunlight on their body. And then this is the pool I finally found, the nine foot pool. I love the, the, the whole bit of it because it just looks like rocks and looks like it, it just looks cool to me and it has different looks on different days wow oh, that's fantastic and again you can really tell that there aren't any of those little micro bubbles like it was in the chlorine every time i've used a chlorine pool that's all i usually get and then of course you're always getting this top light. So really working with the top light, um, having them face certain directions, having to you know, look certain ways so that you can get all of that lighting on them. So yeah, so that was the progression from the very first pool to the pool I use now. And just kind of different, you know, cloudy days versus more of the sunny days um and all of that so it, it's just been a great experience to to do all that but that is that is what i found and that's what works best uh for what i do so i was gonna move on if there aren't any questions about that kind of thing well we do have uh christopher has put in a, a question about uh um i think you missed the earlier part when we described the underwater photo equipment if you scrim above the water to avoid the hard sunlight um so you can go ahead and respond to those two you know just kind of like repeat the, right. the equipment that you used yeah so again the equipment i use is um an outex uh underwater housing it's all it's plastic it's very um move pliable and what's nice about it is i can reach all of my buttons as well as my lens. So I can zoom in, I can zoom out, I can adjust pretty much anything I need to on my camera. I can put almost any camera in there. So that's really, really cool. Um, and then the lenses, I usually, I've been using a 28, but I am gonna start going lower. If you go too low, then you get kind of that obvious fisheye look where the arms are really long and it looks a little weird. But um, but I've also want to try it because if you can get closer, then the clarity level is going to be even better than what it is at the distance. Outex also has um, a dome as well, so they have all different kinds. And again, like I said before, it's all glass, which makes it really really nice for for your camera for the clarity. Again, stickler and clarity here. <laughs> Which I got to realize um, it's not always the thing. 
Okay, we, we, we've got, uh, we've got uh, a few more questions still coming in. Um, mm -hmm. Brian has asked about editing and Brian, we're gonna wrap this up uh, with the last 15 minutes or so on editing and she's actually gonna edit a picture for us. Um, Christopher, um, he asks, um, you know, are you in scuba gear? She's not in, he asks, how do you avoid making your own bubbles? Um, for me personally, I, I just, I blow everything out as I go under and then I hold my breath. So the weight belt helps keep me down. Um, but I don't usually make a lot of my own bubbles, but with the people, I don't mind if they're making bubbles in the beginning to go under. Um, if you also are using, we'll talk about props and stuff in a minute, but if you're using clothing and all that, I always make sure they get in behind me and get all the air out of their clothing and then walk around into the front. Um, I also make sure they avoid jumping into the water because once they jump in, then all of a sudden everything is disrupted and you have to wait for the water to settle. And so that can be kind of a challenge, but I don't mind if they're doing bubbles. Uh, I sometimes think it looks really cool, but then some people just are constantly letting air out and then that gets all stuck in their nose in the photo. So I try to make sure that I tell them, let air out as you go down. But then once you're down there, don't continuously let air out. So that's kind of, I, I still make some bubbles, but it never affects my photo. Yeah, and, and actually if you let the air out, it, it, it helps you go down into the pool. The air is what kind of brings you absolutely, back Absolutely, absolutely. Um, a couple more, we still have a bunch of more questions, which is great. Yeah. Um, Charles, Charles Schinner is asking, is the pool heated? And, and uh, along those lines, uh, uh, Jennifer Wingrove uh, says that uh, heated pool helps as, as someone who has modeled underwater. Um, and, um, and, and how much air you release before descending dictates how deep you can go as well. So release all air before you go deep. Um, so I guess the question to ask you then is, I mean, is, is it a, do you, do you make a point of being sure the pool is heated as well or? I, I do because I, you know, I want them to feel comfortable and living in Colorado, you know, cold water is really cold here, um, <laughs> even in the summertime, but so I find it fine, but I, um, have talked a lot with a lady in Spain and she actually uses like freezing cold water and she likes it that way because she feels she gets more clarity when it's really cold. So yeah. it's kind of up to you uh, what you want your photo to really look like. I don't mind the heat because I feel like I still get the clarity that I'm looking for with it. But I do find that sometimes um, it probably contains more things. I don't know how to say that. Um, Sometimes, because the pool I use is used by a lot of people. And so there's a lot of just, you know, sunscreen and all this kind of stuff. And so sometimes I wonder if the heat activates that more. Um, but for my people, they have loved having it heated. So I'm just sticking with heat for now. <laughs> okay. And then Lynn Tyler King asks about clothing and props. You know, do you bring stuff or do you ask them to bring and wear and you know, do you tell them specific things about what to bring or? Yeah, so I have a huge array of fabrics and skirts and other outfits that I bring for anybody to utilize. Um, I have learned that there are certain things that are, are dangerous underwater, so I am avoiding those now. But one of those main things is tooled skirts. So skirts that have a lots and lots of layers of tool can really drag you down. And because the tool is like tons and tons of little tiny holes, it just traps the water more. And so it can get really dangerous in a deep end pool um, that they can't, they start to freak out because they can't swim up to the surface with it. So I've taken all those out of commission and now I only use like a, a two layered tool skirt, but then all the other skirts I use are either chiffon, um, some, some satin and then like cotton stuff as well. So I bring a, a variety. Most of my people bring their own stuff as well. So base <laughs> leotards, base um, swimsuits, some do 
I have a lot of circus people in my life, so they bring the craziest things. And I'm gonna show some photos here in a minute of all the props people have brought. Um, in my pool, I can't use anything that is breakable or sharp because the lining of the pool I use is, uh, it's, an, it's a lining, it's not solid. So it can rip and tear. So I have to be really careful with um, stuff like that. But most people bring their own stuff and then they utilize whatever I have. Okay, Nana in Brazil is asking, do you use any kind of filter on your lens while you're no, shooting? No, okay. I don't. Um, but Autex does have a, um, a polarized uh, lens as well. So they have several different ones that you can use. I have used once a polarizer on my lens, um, but it, it, it was a weird one. So it caused the connection to disconnect and I ended up almost having a leak. So I didn't want to use that one. So I just need to get a different one. But um, I just use a straight and then do a lot of my editing, obviously after okay timothy park asks do you have any kind of a safety protocol or do you have a lifeguard there or somebody there and along those lines jennifer curry wingrove uh you know talks about uh how she she likes the idea that there's an assistant there to help the model up when they're wearing a heavy costume right so i i don't i um i try to make it as safe as possible by making sure they never go into the deep end they you know, stay in the shallow by taking away the skirts that are drowning people, um, uh, all of that. So I have been really careful, but at the same time, I do it in groups. So there's always, you know, six to seven people always there. So we do have a lot of help if anything were to ever happen. Um, but no, I don't, I've thought about that, but I don't have anybody um, yet I do have a friend who's a lifeguard, so I've invited him to come some, um, but we haven't ever had any, anybody for sure there. Okay. That's it for the questions for right now. Um, and, um, let's see, hang on. We might have one more. Um, when, when you are underwater, how, how long are you actually, um, uh, Drew Forsyth from from uh, England is uh, from Manchester is asking this question. Uh, how long do you actually stay underwater, get your shot? He, he's thinking he can last 10 seconds, I think. <laughs> Yay. Um, I think I can stay down. I haven't actually counted it, but I can usually stay down about 20 seconds or more. Um, but most people, like I said, photographically, they can't stay down longer than that. So I, would, I, I think you could stay down more than 20 seconds. Yeah, but it depends on the person too. So I I just have never counted it. So I can't say I know for sure, but I will stay down as long as they'll stay down. And some people have stayed down to the point where I'm like pushing my limits on what I can hold my breath. But again, I'm letting so much air out. So when you're letting a lot of air out, it is harder to stay down longer um, and take the shot. But I can usually get about... I would say as long as they're staying down between five to 10 shots every time I go under. And how hard is it to get focused down there? For my camera, um, it isn't. I, I have a problem with, I physically can't see um, focus when I go underwater, but I can see the person through my camera. So um, I know on my camera, it has the little you know green indicator that says that it's focused on what I'm pointing it at in the subject. And so that's how I know it's getting focused. But there are times when, you know, the bubbles will come up and so it'll focus on all the bubbles. So you have to be kind of careful. But again, in the salt water, I have very few that end up being out of focus. Yep. Okay. Um, so what's the next step? What were, were, what were I you was just going to gonna show a few pictures of the different props people have brought. Okay. And some of the fabric, just so that you can, everyone can get an idea of what that looks like. So give me a second here. People can be so inventive. So I love that. I always ask them. What, what kind of settings do you use? You use a uh, slower shutter speed and, and more, uh, like do you stop down your f-stop to get more depth of field or? What, what, um, what, what, I... 
I believe I stay right around a 3.2 to 3.5 f-stop. Okay. I usually, depending on what the light's doing, I'm usually at about 500 to 800, sometimes higher if it's really bright on my shutter speed. And then I'm about 200, I stay at 200 ISO. Oh, cool, okay. So I can decrease my, um, my grain as much as possible, my noise. So these are just some photos of some of, you know, the props like masks, things that people bring. I, I have the pearls, so those are mine that they um, can utilize. I have circus people, so they bring <laughs> umbrellas and clowns and so many cool things um real flowers work so much better than fake flowers so this girl brought a whole set of real flowers and it was incredible they floated beautifully they were just they were just amazing um people bring books i have so many people that bring books and she's a um, elementary school teacher and so she wanted to do some you know, for her, for her kids in class. Uh, this lady's an aerialist, so she always brings the coolest stuff, fans, ropes, like she does a little bit of everything. Again, some more flowers and wedding dresses. Everyone usually brings something unique. Uh, roller skates. This is an aerial rope. Of course, the mermaid tail uh, is a big one. This year, I just recently bought one, so that will go into uh, whatever people wanna use. She has a hula hoop, um, aerial silks that people have hung down into the water, magnifying glasses, teapots, masks again some really cool masks this is one of my skirts again this is one of my skirts some more umbrellas umbrellas tend to break a lot underwater so you have to kind of be careful again roller skates magnifying glasses pianos skulls that was a fun one um frames that float on the surface uh, these are flow balls, uh, contact balls for juggling. Fabric, again, I, I provide several different kinds of fabric and really love to um, just initiate some of the stuff with people. Say, here, try this, you know, work with that. Take the fabric, wrap it around, move it with your body. Again, fabric, she's in there somewhere, but we loved this photo. Red obviously stands out really well. Uh, these are water balloons, so it's like a thicker balloon that we filled with water and anchored them down to the bottom of the pool with my weight belt. And that was just a really cool shoot. Uh, this is a parachute skirt um, that I made. So it, aside from what I said earlier, these, this parachute skirt is actually pretty phenomenal underwater and it's not super dragging you down. It looks yeah. like she's like, like she's even just laying on it. Yeah, she she literally was like it was all floating around her, and she just kind mm -hmm. of like floated into it. That's it's just amazing all, all the different things that people can bring and how how interesting you, you know it really is. What, what one of our uh, one of our attendees is asking like what are the ages of of people who do this? Is it is it a younger crowd? Is it an old you know? Is it all over the place? It is all over the place. Um, I have I try not to do little kids because of the um, so, you know safety issue um, as far as just swimming in a pool and not really knowing what they're doing. Um, so I think the youngest I've done is a nine year old, uh, and that was just kind of a her mom was there and her mom was doing it, so I did some with her. But then I've also photographed people who are in their fifties and sixties. So. It just really ranges all over for me. Uh, I have a, like I said, I work with a lot of circus people and a lot of dance people. And so I get a wide variety in age groups for sure. So it's, no, it's a little bit of everything and guys and girls. Like I have a guy coming this weekend who 
wants to use the mermaid tail and be a mermaid. So I think that's really hilarious. And he's a really good friend of mine. So it's like, sure, let's do it. So, but yeah, um, I get a wide range. I, I find that it really, I, it's not just the younger crowd. I mean, I have a lot of clients that are in the 30 range um, in the middle of all of that. Some of them are people who have always dreamt about doing this and it's finally, you know, they get the opportunity to do it. So I really try to make it as accessible and affordable as possible for them to be able to come and do it, to do it with me. So, yeah. So a few things, if there aren't anything else at the moment, um, is I wanted to add, talk just a little bit about directing them. I have learned a lot from, from working with them uh, underwater that has shown that everyone's different. So. I find that people tend to get kind of frustrated with themselves if they can't stay under or they can't um, move a certain way. And so I have found that just giving them instructions in the beginning to kind of give them a focal point or a um, inspiration really helps because sometimes they come and they're just like, I don't know what to do. I feel like I look terrible underwater and, and sometimes they do. <laughs> um, but you just don't give them those pictures, obviously. Uh, but I have found that a lot of stuff profile looks really good stuff coming straight on at you sometimes isn't always attractive to anybody, whether they're tiny or bigger or whatever the water just magnifies everything so you want to make sure that you're always trying to get their best angles and. Um, another thing too that a lot of dancers tend to do is they do like the passes or they do. Um, things where they're bending their legs a lot. And so then you get what I call the kind of the amputee look where they're missing half of their leg because they're coming straight at you and they have their foot bent to the back. So really trying to use turnouts, really trying to direct them where they're using their body in a way that's gonna be more profile to me as the photographer than any kind of straight on types of movement. So really trying to, every time they come up, I look at my photos and I give them direction and I try to help them go back under and do it again. Some definitely don't at all listen and they never listen. So it's kind of hard. But one of my biggest things is I want them to just go under and not swim. And everyone tries to swim when they go under. And so my biggest thing is you just want to sink and you just want to let the water move you so instead of swimming and then posing and then swimming and then posing um you just move through and you work through transitions versus posing and then just rising to the top so the people who do that i get a lot more photos that i can deliver than the people who are always just like these one one pose people so yeah i try <laughs> <laughs> um um are, are we going to talk about like uh, your business model for this? Like about like how, what, what, how it is that you charge, whether it's a session fee and then they order, you know, prints or JPEGs or. Uh... Sure. Yeah. So like I said, I do it in groups of six to seven for two and a half hours. And um, they sign, I, I do two sessions in a day. So I do one in the morning and then one right after kind of early afternoon. And so seven, six to seven people will sign up. Sometimes I only have, you know, three or four, but uh, at the most, probably six. And each of them pays a fee and they get their digital images. So again, I work with people that can't always afford something really expensive. And so I really try to provide quality photography for them and give them an experience that they won't forget. So um, they each are you know they each pay just one fee and that is for the time and for their photos cool. as well and they're all digital i don't do any prints or anything like that with them but yeah so that's the business business model so do you want to do editing yeah i think so let's um uh, let's uh I guess you're going to take a take a shot right from the very beginning and into you and we'll see how you do it in Lightroom and then you're going to take it into Photoshop and uh, show us what you do there as well. Exactly. So excited. Right, just a second. You'd on. almost think that we talked about this. <laughs> really? <laughs> of course we did. 
Okay, so I'm actually going to do a couple because some get really washed out and then some um, have more depth to them already. So this is straight out of camera. I'm just going to adjust it because it's bugging me. Okay, so straight out of camera, the main things I do in Lightroom is I dehaze first. And then I work on the temperature. And a little bit of the tint. And again, every photo is, is different. Um, on this one, I'm going to bring the blacks down just a little. And I'm going to enhance the clarity. And then I'm going to go down into the color section. And I'm going to go down to luminance and take down my blues, which creates it to make it even darker back in the back. And then I'm going to go to my color grading. And I'm just going to hit it right around the orange there. And then I do luminance to take down some of the noise, uh, the noise reduction, sorry. What, what are you setting that luminance at right there? Is that 50? The, the noise reduction, I set it at like, it depends on the photo. So without any, it has, you can see kind of the grain. Mm -hmm. So I usually go around 50, okay. 55, something like that. Some are more, some are less. It depends on how clear the water was that day. Um, so then I, I don't know if this, I think this will work. Where is it? So then I flip it over into Photoshop. Usually I just export it, but hopefully it'll pop up here. I think, I think you're gonna have to change your, uh, which yeah. screen you're sharing because it'll Let me go back pop to up in Photoshop, here. it'll stay. Sorry. Drew is saying that you can't believe these are so clean. <laughs> well, I'm gonna show you one that's not so clean in a minute because this was a really clear day for the pool. Um, some days the pool is, is not clear and I have to work with that. Um, so in Photoshop, this one I probably won't do too much to, but in Photoshop, I go into adjustments and I'll work with color balance sometimes, um, going more reds and, and yellows. Sometimes I'll just show this now, but I don't always use the channel mixer, but sometimes like you can adjust the channel mixer to get a little more um, color or a little less color. And then if I want, I will go and either do levels or brightness and contrast and kind of just darken it a little bit more. And then um, I'll take out, you know, things like this thing on the bottom of the pool. Sometimes I'll take out the sides, but not always. It just depends on if it's distracting me in the photo. So that's one, and that's literally all I do with it. I play around with it. Um, so I'm gonna show another one that's a little more a little less clear. So this is straight out of the camera. Again, it just, it, it almost appears that they're kind of getting washed out. So I'm gonna start with the dehaze again, bringing it down and then the temperature and the tent a little bit, taking the blacks down just a little, bringing the clarity in. Sometimes texture, it kind of depends on what I want to, what I want it to look like. I'm gonna it's amazing, just, just what you did right there about how much that has changed. I know, isn't it amazing? I love it. It's like, it's like magic. It's so cool. Um, and this particular one, I'm gonna, I don't know if you can see on her dress, but when I move the aqua down, it like takes the tint a little bit off of the white of her dress. So I'm moving that down, moving the blue down just a little bit. And then again, going to color grading on highlights and clicking like kind of in the orange area. And then going back to my noise reduction, I'm gonna zoom in 
and again bring it to like 53 and in the 50 range there. So again, you can go from it being completely widened out to something more like this. Another one here, um, she, one thing I try to avoid is, is the color blue in the blue water, because it can look really washed out, but you can still bring some of those colors out of that by the dehazing and the temperature. And again, the clarity. Exposure a little bit. And then going down, I don't always use the luminance, but sometimes, because if you go too far, then it just looks weird. Um, but sometimes I use that. And then finding these orange highlights to kind of bring out the color and texture, the color of their skin. And then going into noise reduction and reducing the noise. So those are like a really, this one is on a really bright sunny day and the water was not clear. So this turned out, I was, I was pleasantly surprised. And then we have stuff like this one that is again, gorgeous, but I love bringing out the color in this cause it's just, this is a very um, cloudy day. It was almost raining. And again, using the dehaze, bringing in the temperature, a little bit of the tent, the clarity. It's already kind of dark, so I probably won't mess with the blacks too much. Um, maybe a little bit on the blue here. And then again, putting that pop of orange back in. So, yeah, so that's the editing process. That is how it goes. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Are there are there any questions about the editing? It's really pretty straightforward. I haven't found. Um, I find that I guess I find that people look at this and I see what what it can look like, and so they see something. I I, I don't show this too many people, but you know, they see something like this photo and they're like, oh my gosh. Um, I had a lady who I helped with some underwater photography. Actually, I'm gonna go to this one real quick. I had a lady that helped with underwater photography and she kind of had some images that first came out and she almost gave up because she was like, these look terrible. And so we worked with the editing process and just showed her that it isn't just that you, you know, you have to work with it. So I wanted to kind of show this one um, because in Lightroom, I just didn't really get the, the color I was wanting to get from it. And so I'm gonna flip it over into, um, just I'm gonna flip it over into Photoshop and show you a few more um, things with especially some of the color stuff on that one. And literally sometimes it's just about playing around with it and getting it into what, you know, playing with the sliders, playing with the color. Um, it's, it's all about playing really. So let me share my other screen real quick. So if I go into the channel mixer here, then I can work with like playing around with some of these tones. And then also working again with the color balance and bringing out a little more of like her color and trying to be as natural as possible. It's just amazing, just, you know, like that, that the first time you look at it straight out of camera and like, you know, we would look at it and say, oh, this isn't going to work out too well. Just right, like that right. said, and you just sit there and say, no, no, no. Yeah. And you, you know? just keep playing with it and it keeps like, it keeps going and going and, and going. <laughs> it's really okay. fun. 
And I think that's the creative part that I love so much is, you know, whenever I do editing in general, I, I love to edit the way the photo speaks to me um, versus just a blanket edit for everything. I can shoot this shot and then I can shoot the next shot and it'll have a totally different color because she was closer to the surface or she was further down or she was, you know, six inches more away from me. And that's how much the color tones can change in the water, literally from one photo to the next. Um, so you have to get creative and you have to work with, with what you got and pull out what you can. So, so yeah. when you're down there, like, like that shot right there, let's just say, mm -hmm. how many shots did you take, you know, of her kind of like in that position before you end up getting that shot? And I don't mean just her, but I mean, generally speaking with anyone, like, like, like when you're trying to get a certain shot, how many shots, you know, do you, do you take? For, to get um, it depends on the person. So like I mentioned before, there are certain people that go down and they do one pose. Right. And then they just, I call it the elevator. And then they just up to the surface. And then there are the people that go down and they do like that pose. And then she moves into the next one. And then she moves into the next one. So the elevator people tend to, you know, I get like two shots because I get the shot. Um, then the other people, I just keep clicking like I do when I am on land and I keep working with it. And then if I see something that I want them to do again, then I'll, we'll come up and I'll go and I'll tell them, Hey, when you did your leg over like this and then pushed it that way. And so sometimes then they'll go back down and get that certain look if I wanted to retry that, but that particular pose, she kept moving. So that was the one shot in probably a series of five or six that her leg was, was just perfect like that and looked unique and weird and cool. Like the other one, her, just her foot was sticking up and then it was getting higher and higher because she just kept moving. And I think that's the biggest thing is if they keep that slow kind of movement as they go, that improv type feel, then you're going to get so many more shots than you would if it's someone that just goes down and does one pose. And as many so, times as I've told those people to not do one pose, they, they still do. So. But it's, it's hard enough to do a pose and then you do it underwater. Try to <laughs> look elegant. Um, so when you guys come back up, I mean, do you actually take the time to show them the pictures or do you just say, okay, um, let's try and do this, try and do this different. Is that what you, you just basically give them instructions and then you guys go back down and do it again? Right. Um, sometimes I've shown them uh, the photo because I couldn't explain it well enough or they weren't grasping it. Um, but for the most part, they tend to be pretty aware of their bodies under there. So they, you know, I say, remember, you know, your foot was this way and it needs to be this way. So I'll demonstrate whatever I need to, to show them what is different. So the answer, yeah, is generally I do not uh, show them just because it's hard to see in the back of the camera and I don't shoot tethered underwater. So. And, and are they... Do they generally try to have their eyes open underwater or do some of them, they just can't do eyes open or how does that work? The salt water actually is really nice to open your eyes. It doesn't sting or burn or um, like chlorine does. I, I think it burns a little when I've done it, but not to the point where I can't handle it. So most people open their eyes, but they start off with them closed and I don't have a preference. Sometimes it looks gorgeous. Sometimes it looks beautiful with their eyes closed. I think when they have their eyes open, if they're at a distance from you and they're facing you, it looks really creepy because it's just like black kind of, it doesn't show right, um, right. detail necessarily. So if they're going to open their eyes, I try to get them to do more profiles so that we get, you know, light on their eyes. So it's not just these black kind of creepy looking eye sockets. Okay. And, and, and uh, we have a question somebody's asking about makeup do they do they wear you know makeup and, and if they do how often do they show up with uh, with with uh, not waterproof makeup <laughs> a lot and you'd be surprised a lot of people don't show up with towels i find that really funny um anyway uh, so yes so yes and no on makeup i try to prevent people from wearing too much 
So I have them, when they ask, I'll have them, you know, try to do waterproof eyeliner, waterproof mascara, um, try to avoid eyelashes. People put on the fake ones and they just start coming off. Even the magnetic ones do. So I try to keep people from not doing that, but I do have a few that are very, very good on doing um, makeup in general. So they'll go to town and they'll do all of it. And then they have a spray that's kind of a, a waterproof spray that they spray on and that sets it. And then you just can't touch it. You can't rub your eyes when you get up. You can't like do any of that. So for the most part, I try to you know keep people to a very small makeup regime. Obviously, you're not going to put on base or any kind of powder or anything like that. Do, do you wear contacts? I have had people wear contacts, but mostly they do not. So if they wear glasses, yeah. they put the glasses on the side of the pool and they get in because they aren't going to be able to and, see anyway. And it, so, so, so generally, do you discourage people from wearing their contacts underwater? I have never really said one way or the other. So okay. I've had I've had a very few that have done it. Um, most people don't do it, but I haven't really had anybody ask me. So do you, do you wear contacts? Oh no, I do not. Okay. Do you do you wear? Heather Haney has a great question here, um, and, and that is when you're underwater, are you wearing goggles to help you like see? Yeah, yeah. I wear goggles underwater. I okay. I just have a pair that works pretty good for me. But I, I, it just is blurry underwater. So once you get under there, it's not as clear as what you see in the camera. And I keep my camera like, like I hold it a little bit away from my face. So I look at the display versus looking through the um, eyepiece. No, oh, that makes sense, right? Okay. Okay. Um... We're, we're, we're coming to the end now, and this is a great time for any of you who have any questions. I've been, you know, like putting them through to her as you've been asking, but uh, uh, please, you know, come through with any other questions that you guys might have. Um, and we'll just give it a little bit. Uh, Drew says, can you speak a little bit about your artistic process a little? And Drew, I'm, I'm kind of curious, do you mean the artistic process, because uh, there's two different things that you do. One is, you know, you're with your editing. The other part is with, uh, um, I guess, your artistic direction, the kind of clothing they wear. You know, like, like I, I guess, like, how much do you, because a lot of these people obviously have never been underwater before, you know, so, and, and you talked about how much you try to direct them, you know, before you go in there. Um, and I think that's probably what, uh, Drew is asking about because um, um, it's it's there's so many things that come into play the way the fabrics are floating in the water and then their body position in relation to the body to the to the uh, fabrics. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And I think I know you've already talked about it a little bit. Yeah, I um, initially I had when I first did the first shoot, I gave people kind of some inspiration you know, let's try this. Or I had seen an underwater photo and gave them that as an inspiration. Let's look into trying this. And, and that just never worked out because it was like a total flop. So I try to make sure that people come with not, I mean, I love that they have ideas, but I also want them to realize that a lot of the times when you have this specific vision, it's not going to come about really. So I love to work in the moment and I love to work organically. So when I see something underwater and I start to, to envision what it can look like and what I know the fabric does, I play with the fabric myself. So I you know, um, know how it moves, know, know what it does. And so I try to really get them to do that. I have one lady that comes with probably 300 ideas every single time. <laughs> and she's she's hilarious and I love her to death um, but half of them won't work and so then we end up spending all of this time on all these different ideas and I love it but at the same time sometimes she just wants to keep going and I have to stop her and say you know this just isn't going to work let's move on to the next idea um, 
but for me, it happens while it's happening. I see it underwater. I see the movement happen. I see what they can do. And then I come up and I say, hey, try this. Try, you know, moving the fabric this way. Wrap it around one leg and then bring it up, you know. And so then I start to give them direction on all of the things that they can do with what they have, whether it's their prop or I'm bringing a skirt in or I'm bringing the fabric in. And I think that's where the creative process happens is I don't sit there and think about, oh, I'm going to do this and this and this. I used to, but I don't as much anymore um, because I love to see what comes out of what we're doing. So that's kind of my process, I guess, if you want to call it that, <laughs> if it is a process. And, and, and Robert uh, Sullivan asked about using supplemental lighting, uh, which, which you know you don't use. Um, right. He's saying that radio transmitters won't transmit through water. I, I, obviously, I've never tried that, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, most most people I've talked to, um, <coughs> you you can have like you can be connected, but at the same time, I think most people I've talked to use a constant. Um, there are flashes. I've seen people like put a flash out over the top of the water on the outside, and mm -hmm. it be constant or it be um, popped as well, but. I, because I went with the way I, I do it, I just never um, wanted, I looked into lighting, but I just never wanted to go in that direction. So, but I love how those turn out too. It just I think, wasn't where I was looking for. I think the beauty of what you're talking about is you, you're, you're creating these incredibly artistic pictures and you're doing it you know, without having to spend a lot of money or, 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 right. or having like, a, a, you know, like, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you don't have the fanciest camera necessarily. Right. Um, and that's, I think that's what should inspire people in here is, is that you can, you can do something like this, you know, without, you know, using somebody's backyard pool with, right. with, uh, you know, without having thousands of dollars of lighting or, or uh, a, a camera housing that costs, you know, uh, more than, some of them cost like eight, $10,000 or more. Um, exactly, exactly. And then you have to charge, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars to your clients. And I do not work with those kinds of people that can afford that. So yeah, I mean, you work with what you can in your environment and that is just how I found you know, I wanted that more natural look. I wanted the look that doesn't look like they're in front of a flash. So I really wanted to to keep it as minimalistic as I as I could. Okay, Brad Matthews does have a question though, and that is that not everyone is comfortable in the water. And yeah, how do you help them? You know, with those that are, you know, that 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 have that apprehension or fear or whatever, and and or or just can't get comfortable in the twenty seconds before they hit that right. fight or flight, you know, thing and start going up. Yeah, I've, I've had a couple of people like that. And first of all, most people don't sign up if they're super uncomfortable like that. Um, I've had a couple though that, that came in and one lady, um, she, she really struggled. She had a fear of water, really fear of drowning. And Yet she was coming to try to capture uh, to capture that fear, to conquer that fear. Um, she had been through a lot in her life and this was just part of her story that she was trying to move forward in. And so with her, um, it was just patience. It was not making her, because every time she'd come up, she'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, you know? But it was patience with her. It was trying to find the ways that could help calm her. Um, not going too deep, obviously, but helping her remember to let the water embrace her. And I know that sounds kind of cliche, but it really was about reminding her that she had freedom and she had control, even though we were in water, underwater, all of that. So I've had about two, maybe three clients and more than anything, they get on themselves about it and they start to put themselves down and they start to say, you know, don't do this. I can't do this. I'm horrible. I'm terrible. I'm drowning. I'm freaking out. And so it's more about calmly talking to them and then giving them suggestions. I use one suggestion a lot, which is um, we did it a lot in, in, in dance and in choreography was uh, it's called the egg concept. And so you pretty much just 
wrap your arms around your knees and you go under and then you just slowly start to like unfold out of the egg and then come back into it. And so giving them tips and things to focus on versus I've got to hold my breath. I've got to point my toes. I've got to, you know, all these corrections, give them a direction. Um, and then they can flow into that direction versus having to focus on I'm doing everything wrong. So okay. That's, that's the best I can give. Okay. We, you know, Rich Ryan says, be careful with strobes, with, you know, electricity. And yeah. That's another thing. I, I don't want to use electricity around water. Right. Exactly. Um, and, and then uh, Brian Balloon uh, just asked, you know, if there's anybody, you know, do you have any favorite um, underwater photographers that you pay attention to? Um, I do. I wish I had them pulled up just a second. Let me, well, I can find them real quick. Um, mainly there is a couple over in Europe that I really love. And I, let me, if I can give me just a second. Uh, while, while you're looking for that, I'll yeah. just mention that there is a, another photographer I know of that does underwater uh, shoots and that's Adam Atun. That's a T T O U N. Mm -hmm. uh, he does some really nice underwater work as well. Um, not necessarily with dancers, but uh, underwater work. Just in general, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so let me see here. The person... Okay, so the person I follow, which looks nothing like what I do, <laughs> because, but I love their aesthetic. Um, it's on Instagram, and I, I'm not exactly sure what their actual name is, but it's Chandelier dot j all lowercase and they i believe have like an underwater studio where they have different looks and different backgrounds and just some really really cool stuff like that so i like to follow them they just have a unique perspective they i believe use lighting but um really love love their imagery and I think I love it because they tell a story. Yep. And um, I, I, I just, I pick and choose. I don't think I really follow any one specific person more than that. Um, I see a photo and I like that photo. And a lot of times they aren't people who even do underwater. They just did it once or twice or, yeah. you know, they, they do other things. So I don't follow anyone specifically. Yep. And Brad mentions Howard Schatz. Um, now, I, not everyone here may be following you, so can you share your Instagram so everybody knows uh, uh, where to see a lot of your pictures? Yeah, it's M Worth Photography, and it's W I R T H. On okay. There. Okay. Well, Martha, thank you very much. This was very like uh, inspiring. I'm I'm kind of excited. I want to try this myself. <laughs> now I got to go find somebody with a saltwater pool. <laughs> I do have, if you wanted one last thing, um, I do have some of my favorites that I've taken. If you wanted to see those real quick. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and pop those on real quick. And then I'll, I'll include those, you know, when we put it on our education page, I'll include those pictures on there as well. So let's just uh, Let me wrap go. up with these pictures here. Yep. So yeah, so these are some of, of my favorites that I have taken mainly in that one pool that I finally found. This is the one that, that I entered last year. And won our, won, won our competition, yeah. yeah. I just love her. She was a great mover underwater. She had some amazing abilities. I love flipping photos when there's a great reflection. Mm -hmm. So it's like they're floating on top of. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. And just finding the light, when you can find that natural light, it just turns out gorgeous. Again, fabric is amazing underwater. And reflections, and it's one of my favorite things to try to get if they can capture that. Or when the rays come in, I love it when the rays mm -hmm. come in. That's yeah, that's beautiful. beautiful. Yep, 
and there you go. All right. Well, thank you very much, Martha. Um, we'll get this stuff so everybody can see it and, uh, and uh, we will catch you on the next one. So thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody.